Good evening and welcome. Very pleased that you are here. I'm Stephen Friedman. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Academic Officer at Fordham University. Our distinguished speaker, Gerald Corrigan, Managing Director of Goldman Sachs. Uh, Father McShane, the President of Fordham University. Uh, John Tognino, the Chairman of the Board. Pat Nasmith, the Vice Chair. Other trustees that will be joining us in a few minutes. Our honored guests, our faculty, students, and friends. Uh, Sander Flom, uh, our generous benefactor, making this evening and many other evenings like this possible. Uh, uh, three of our deans are here tonight. Uh, dean Himmelberg, who will speak in a few moments, our interim dean of the Graduate School of Business Administration and co-dean of faculty. And uh, we have with us uh, Dean Rapaccioli, the dean of the College of Business and the co-dean of uh, faculties. And uh, Nancy Bush, uh, Dean Bush, uh, who's here tonight, uh, the dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And it's always wonderful to have a, a distinguished alum of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and, and tonight's speaker earned his master's degree and his doctoral degree from uh, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences here at Fordham. This lecture series, developed through the generosity of Sander Flom, provides Fordham University's Graduate School of Business Administration with opportunities for our students to connect with notable leaders in the world of business. As the founder of Flom Partners, a consulting firm focusing on transformational thinking for the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. Sander Flom is a world leader recognized as an agent of change and demonstrates that agent of change on a daily basis. In 2002, Mr. Flom joined Fordham as an adjunct professor of management at the university's Graduate School of Business Administration, where he established the Leadership Forum, a course focused on teaching leadership qualities to future professionals. We acknowledge with profound gratitude his thoughtful generosity and his countless contributions to the Graduate School of Business Administration and to Fordham University as a whole. He currently serves as a chair of the GBA uh, Board of Advisors. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Himmelberg, Interim Dean of Fordham's Graduate School of Business Administration. Bob? Um, we at Fordham's um, GBA are proud to support the Flom Leadership Lecture Series and to welcome E. Gerald Corrigan as this year's inaugural speaker. Mr. Corrigan's involvement in the Flom Leadership Lecture Series brings together two individuals uh, who not only share a very high degree of success in their respective fields, but who also share a generosity of heart and spirit and a continued and demonstrated commitment to philanthropy. We're honored to recognize both men as notable and generous members of the Fordham family. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Sander, Sander Flom, <clears throat> chair of uh, the Flom Leadership Series. Sander's also the chair of our advisory board and has done a great deal to forward the work of GBA this year, I know. Thank you. It's really a wonderful honor um, to be in the presence of uh, Dr. Corrigan tonight. And Jerry, we really appreciate your taking the time. We know the kind of commute that you have and the, and the very busy schedule that you do, but it's going to be a treat for all of us hearing you and hopefully telling us uh, where, this, where this government is headed. Because we're all a little confused at this point. Anyway, before <laughs> um, before I get into uh, the, the the very esteemed credentials of Dr. Corrigan, let me uh, uh, let me thank a couple of people in the audience. Uh, the, this this good lecture series that Fordham has put on uh, couldn't be done without the help of some wonderful people. Um, we have. Uh, Two of the three in the room, one is sitting in the front row, uh, Phyllis Esposito, who spent many, many years at Goldman Sachs, and one of the wizards of the financial industry, Phyllis Esposito. <clears throat> um, 
This, the second person, uh, another uh, big Wall Street hitter, Doreen uh, Morgavo, unfortunately had to be with us on tonight. Well, fortunately had to be with us on tonight and couldn't make the, uh, the talk. The third person, um, Michelle, I can't pronounce her last name that well. Is it Flaum? Flaum? Um, Michelle Flaum is with us tonight, and it's, it's, it's these three who get together every other week to plan this wonderful lecture series for, for, for all of us. So, and uh, last but certainly not least, Keith Norton, who has been fantastic. Keith, are you in, you in the room? There, there he is. Keith, uh, a wonderful friend, a very, very loyal Fordham person, and just works overtime to get this stuff done. So, Keith, on behalf of everyone in this room, thank you very much for what you do. Um, this is going to take about 45 minutes to read Mr. Corrigan's intro, but I'll try and speak as quickly as I can and try and nail it down to one. Um, Gerald Corrigan's uh, academic career began at Fairfield University, where he earned his first degree, a bachelor's in economics. Um, moved on and earned a master's degree and a doctoral degree at, in economics at Fordham in 1965 and 1971. I didn't want to give away your A's, Jerry, but it's in the script. Um, a towering and, let me say, one of the most respected figures in the world of finance, he served as managing director at Goldman Sachs since 1994 and a partner in the firm since 1996. He's also chair of Goldman Sachs uh, Bank USA and a strategic mentor to both the firm and his numerous clients. Now, many of you will recall that he served as president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for 25 years and was vice chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee. So all questions about the Fed can be asked of Jerry alone over a drink after the talk. Okay, Jerry? If they can pull you in the corner, fine. Um, in in uh, 2007, Jerry made a most general, generous and incredible gift of $5 million to Fordham to create the Corrigan Share in International Business and Finance and endowed professorship in the Graduate School of Business Administration which bolsters the university's reputation as a global business center focusing on economic and business research and policy. His generous gift also further endowed the E. Gerald Corrigan Endowed Scholarship Fund, which has provided financial community to minority students at Fordham for nearly a decade. He's quite a man. Mr. Corrigan, we look forward to your talk tonight leadership, making the right things happen, and trust me, he is the man who makes the right things happen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. E. Gerald Corrigan. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra and Bob and Steve. And as always, it's, it's kind of fun uh, to find myself back in the environs of Fordham, except as some of you, uh, I think, already know, this is a double dip today because I spent a couple of hours here at lunch today in a rather fascinating uh, exercise. Uh, Fordham uh, was selected by the Opus Foundation uh, to be the leading Catholic university uh, for the year 2010 that was asked to select uh, the winner and the second place candidate among a series of non-for-profit institutions uh, operating all around the world. But these uh, non-for-profit institutions weren't your run-of-the-mill non-for-profit institutions because, in fact, uh, covering countries ranging from Afghanistan to uh, Nicaragua and Mali and Africa, these were all very local, down-to-earth organizations who truly 
uh, are engaged in, uh, in God's work, literally, because each of them in their own way uh, are devoted entirely to uh, making good things happen for very severely disadvantaged people, especially children, uh, in various parts of the world. And I must say, uh, Father, uh, uh, as I mentioned to you privately, that was quite an experience, uh, having to sit with a dozen other people uh, as a jury uh, to select uh, among the seven non-for-profits uh, the one uh, that would receive a million dollar grant from the Opus Foundation. And when you read their credentials of all seven of these organizations, uh, you could have easily had a landslide vote for any one of them because uh, each of them really were doing absolutely extraordinary things. And uh, I have to say that that was one of the more fascinating and I think enjoyable uh, two hours I've spent in a long time. It was really a privilege to be a part of it. And Father McShane, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to have been a part of it. Now, I don't remember how the title or the subject matter of tonight's talk emerged. I don't remember specifically whether it was someone at Fordham who said to me, what we'd like you to do is to talk about leadership, or whether it was I uh, who suggested to somebody at Fordham that I would like to talk about leadership. Um, but in retrospect, uh, whether they asked me or I asked them, it turned out uh, for me to be a kind of fun thing to do. Uh, because uh, we all take those terms, leader and leadership, uh, largely for granted. Uh, we seldom, or at least speaking for myself, really step back and start to ask yourself the hard question, well, what, what do those terms really mean? And what do they mean in a very pragmatic, real-world sense? Now, I have to make a confession uh, before I get too far into the substance of what I want to say uh, that has two parts. Uh, the first part of my confession is the following. As all of you know, you can walk into any bookstore any place and you can find thousands of titles having to do with leaders and leadership. They're every place. Uh, I imagine the Fordham Book Score has quite a number of those titles themselves. Well, I have to confess up front that I have never read any of those books. And after you listen to what I have to say, you may well conclude that I should have read some of them. <laughs> but I, I never have had any interest whatsoever in picking up one of those books and, and reading it. The second confession I have to make is, is a bias. And it's a bias that I suppose I should at least apologize somewhat for. But you often hear uh, the phrase that uh, leaders are born. Well, uh, personally, I think that's a lot of nonsense. Uh, leaders aren't born. They grow into it. They become leaders by virtue of stuff that's a part of them. But the idea that someone comes out of the womb is it's destined or predestined to be a leader, give me a break. That's, that's just not how things work. At least I don't think so. So let me, let me try to tackle this subject, which as I said, is kind of fun uh, to step back and really uh, think about. Now for starters, I think we would all agree that leadership is one of society's great intangibles. We all know it when we see it, but we also find it very difficult to define it. We also know that there are many prominent cases 
in which very skillful leaders have used their leadership skills and traits in ways that have resulted in unthinkable societal misery, sometimes measured in the loss of life for millions of human beings. Witness, for example, the legacy of people like Hitler and Stalin. And I point that out because I think that it is very important when we speak of leadership. What truly matters are leaders and leadership that work in the direction of making the right things happen, not making the wrong things happen. Now, as individuals, we all have witnessed leadership at several levels. For example, at a very personal level, we have all experienced relationships with a parent, a priest, a professor, a coach, who through their quiet leadership have had a profound and highly positive influence on our values and our development, even if it is also true that most of us are quite slow in recognizing the ways in which these leaders have shaped our attitudes and our behavior. Now, at another level, we have also experienced leadership in terms of the traits that we see at a distance in larger-than-life personalities in the pursuit of politics, social justice, or even sports. For example, I think most of us would certainly agree that Churchill and FDR were great political leaders during the war years of the 1940s. Similarly, Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King are white, rightly and widely recognized as great leaders in the cause of social justice. While in the somewhat more mundane world of sports, Vince Lombardi, a Fordham alum, uh, and John Wooden, for example, stand out as great leaders. But what's interesting about that vision of leadership, whether it's uptight and up close in a very personal, if not intimate way, or it's in the greater scope of how we view uh, these larger than life personalities. What I think is protect, perhaps particularly interested is that often, even on reflection, we fail to really ask ourselves the question about these leaders as to why it is that we are also willing to bestow upon them the crown of leadership. Now, some of us have had the occasion to find ourselves in a position at a relatively young age in which we have had very close working relationships with individuals who are, in fact, among those larger-than-life personalities and leaders. I am one of those lucky individuals because when I was still quite young, to be specific, in my mid-30s, to be exact, I had the incredible good fortune uh, to work with and to learn from four truly exceptional human beings, each of whom were great leaders in their own right. 
Now, these individuals uh, were as follows. Now, the first, which will come as no surprise, I suspect, to many of you, was Paul Volcker, uh, who became president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in 1975, when I was 34 years old and the corporate secretary of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, four years later, in 1979, uh, Volcker, as you know, was named chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. And when he took that post, he called me up and said, what are you doing for the next few weeks? I said, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. And he says, well, I want you to come to Washington with me and help me out in this job. And I was and all of uh, 38 or 39 years old, and, I had, and I'll get into this in greater detail in a moment, but I had no idea of what life was going to be like uh, in that period. Now, uh, Paul uh, has devoted virtually his entire life uh, to one noble cause after another the Holocaust gold settlement, the oil for food, Iraqi uh, arrangement, and many others. And he is, uh, by my standard, literally the quintessential public servant. He has devoted his entire life uh, to public service and public interest. Uh, the second of these four, uh, and I apologize that these are all gentlemen. I, I, wish, I wish I had thought of a woman, but I, I had to go with my, with my beliefs here. The second uh, was Gordon Richardson, or perhaps I should say Lord Richardson. Uh, Gordon was the governor of the Bank of England between 1973 and 1983. And Lord Richardson, and this is no exaggeration, I think has received from the British government and others just about every award and recognition that the British government can convey on an individual. And as you know, the British government is very good at conveying awards on people. I think Gordon has them all. But interestingly enough, and in some ways, perhaps as important. Uh, Gordon was, by a huge margin, the most eloquent public speaker I have ever witnessed in my life. I, this man was just unbelievable. And he could stand up with no notes. He had a habit of putting his hands in his jacket pockets like this and walking and whether it was central banking or the arts or literature, I mean, it didn't matter. Philosophy, theology, he would give these extemporaneous talks about the importance of independent central banks. And he would lace into these talks spontaneously all of these references drawn from every conceivable form of human discipline that you can think of. And, you know, it was, it was magic. <laughs> and I said, I've never, ever seen anybody with that skill set. And he always brought it to bear on real world, pragmatic, here and now issues. <clears throat> uh, the third, some of you, uh, I think, will know, or at least know uh, by reference, uh, was <clears throat> Lou Preston. Uh, Lou Preston was the chairman and CEO of the Morgan Bank in the 80s, which again was when I was president of the New York Fed. And after he retired uh, from the Morgan Bank, Lou was named the president of the World Bank, where he almost single-handedly essentially redefined the role of the World Bank in its efforts to mitigate hunger and poverty around the world. And when I say 
literally redefined uh, the role of the World Bank in, in meeting that challenge. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, as a matter of some coincidence, I suppose, uh, Mr. Preston uh, also served as a member of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York uh, at the same time I was president of the bank. So as you can see, I got to know these people pretty well. These were not casual and distant relationships. Uh, the fourth of this group <clears throat> was Cyrus Vance, or as everyone called him, Cy Vance. Cy was, uh, I should mention, I just uh, forgot to mention this, uh, Gordon Richardson, uh, unfortunately, three days ago, at age 94, passed away. And this is a real loss to humanity. Um, but anyway, to get back to Cy Vance, Cy, among other things, was kind of the classic American diplomat very much in the tradition of the famous wise men who crafted U.S. foreign policy in the years immediately after World War II. Among his many official positions, Mr. Vance was President Kennedy's Secretary of the Army, President Johnson's Deputy Secretary of Defense, and President Carter's Secretary of State. Further, and on behalf of the United States and the United Nations, Sai also participated in many peacekeeping missions around the world and was one of the lead negotiators in the SALT II discussions and negotiations with the Soviet Union. Here, too, uh, during my tenure at the New York Fed, uh, Mr. Vance served as chairman of the board of directors at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, in the 80s. So this is kind of a classy group of guys, if I, if I could put it a little bit in the vernacular. Now, I don't think you're going to be surprised uh, when I say that uh, I regarded and still regard uh, these four gentlemen as truly great leaders. But saying that, again, begs the question of what it is about these individuals that separates them from the many, many other effective leaders that I have worked with over the years. And in reflecting on that question and its answers, I find it interesting that, in fact, these four men had very little in common, other than the kind of freakish coincidence that Mr. Pre Mr. Preston and Mr. Vance uh, were both outstanding college ice hockey players. So maybe that's something you could think about. If you want to make it, maybe you got to go back to college and play hockey. But obviously, uh, that's not the case. But I do think on reflection uh, that each of them had a trait that they all shared. And that trait is what I like to call presence. That is, each of them could walk into a room, even of strangers, and those in the room would instantly recognize and sense that they were in the presence of a true leader. There's something about that very, very infinitesimally small group of people that passed that test that you just know it. And certainly, I have experienced over the years many times, which I actually witnessed what I've just said, the presence to walk in a room and all of a sudden the room is quiet and everybody says, hmm, this guy's got something. Now, let me emphasize, um, uh, however, that the term presence 
as I use it, um, <clears throat> I think has little or nothing in common with the term charisma. Since we can all think of any number of individuals who are very long on charisma, but very short on substance. So presence is very, very different uh, than charisma. 